Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. It is my pleasure to introduce Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin III and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, Jr. The Secretary and the Chairman will deliver opening remarks and then we'll have time to take a few questions. Please note that I will moderate those questions and call on journalists. And due to time constraints, I would ask that those I call upon, please limit your follow-up questions to give your colleagues a chance to ask their question. I appreciate your assistance with this. And with that, over to Secretary Austin. Thanks, Patrick, and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us at Ramstein today. We've just held another highly successful meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. We've met 20 times now, and I'm more determined than ever. This contact group continues to be inspired by the spirit of Ukraine. For more than two years, Ukraine's troops have been fight fighting valiantly against the Kremlin's invaders. And Ukraine's people have refused to be cowed by Russian attacks on civilians in cities and villages far from the front line. And the Ukraine people, Ukrainian people will not let Putin prevail, and neither will we. As President Biden has said, we will not walk away. Now, Putin hoped to isolate Ukraine. Instead, he left himself alone with Iran and North Korea. Now, that's a far cry from the some 50 nations of goodwill from all around the world who gathered again today. Our allies and partners are here because they understand the stakes. And Ukraine's friends continue to come up with innovative solutions to make key new commitments to provide Ukraine with urgently needed capabilities, especially air defense and armor and artillery ammunition. And we're proud to stand with them. That's why we recently announced more U.S. security assistance for Ukraine valued at up to $300 million. And our allies and partners continue to step up. And the United States must also. Over nearly two years, this contact group has generated more than $88 billion in security assistance commitments for Ukraine. And that includes 15 uh, U.S. allies who are committing more to Ukraine than us as a share of their GDP. Now, we continue to focus on two tracks. First, we're working together to provide near-term support for Ukraine's troops, and second, we're hard at work with, Ukrainian, with Ukraine's leaders to plan its long-term defense and deterrence. This long-term support is rooted in the capability coalitions, and they are now up and running. Capability coalitions bring together countries to focus on Ukraine's most critical immediate and long-term needs. Our aim is to help Ukraine build a combat-credible force for the long haul. The capability coalitions will help will, will let Ukraine's friends coordinate our support for years to come. And they create a coherent, nimble, and sustained approach to Ukraine's long-term security. So this morning, I convened the first meeting of the Capability Coalition Leadership Group. That meeting infused even more unity of effort and purpose across these eight coalitions. More than a dozen allies leading one or more of the capability coalitions gather to discuss our progress and coordinate the way ahead for cross-cutting issues. The United States is grateful to Denmark, Estonia, France, Germany, Iceland, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland and the United Kingdom, they have all stepped up to lead the capability coalitions and to commit resources and personnel to this critical task. And their leadership is a testament to the unity and resolve at Ramstein today. Now, the United States stands by Ukraine because it's the right thing to do and because America cares when freedom is at risk. But we also, also stand by Ukraine because it's crucial to our own security. 
The United States would face grave new perils in a world where aggression and autocracy are on the march, and where tyrants are emboldened, and where dictators think that they can wipe a democracy off the map. So when we invest in Ukraine's security, we invest in our own security. And we strengthen this contact group's shared vision of an open world of rules and rights and responsibilities. Today, Ukraine's survival is in danger. And America's security is at risk. And they don't have a, they don't have a day to waste. And we don't have a day to spare either. So I leave here today fully determined to keep U.S. security assistance and ammunition flowing. And that's a matter of survival and sovereignty for Ukraine. And it's a matter of honor and security for America. And make no mistake, Putin is watching. The world is watching. And history is watching. And with that, General Brown, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Two days after the start of World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt said in a fireside chat, when peace has been broken anywhere, the peace of all countries everywhere is in danger. Russia shattered peace on the European continent with its continued efforts to invade and annex Ukraine. Nearly two years, the Ukraine Defense Contact Group has reaffirmed that the broken peace in Ukraine affects peace for us all. And this coalition of steadfast allies and partners continues to work to achieve just and lasting peace on the European continent. Today, the European Defense Contact Group met to discuss our continued commitments to support Ukraine, commitments that are turned into action by some 50 countries here in attendance. I want to echo uh, many of the comments that were made today uh, and thank Secretary Austin for his continued leadership and strategic vision for this international coalition. I also want to thank um, uh, Defense Minister Umarov, who was with us today, and for guiding Ukraine and its forces with grit and resistance. I also want to thank all the nations represented uh, who joined us for the Ukraine Defense Contact Group to provide the invaluable support. Eight decades ago, President Roosevelt highlighted how global security is interconnected. When conflict disrupted peace in Europe in 1939, it threatened global security and plunged the world into conflict. Today, global security has been challenged once again. And a broken peace in Ukraine represents a risk for us all. Just over two years ago, Putin amassed 180,000 troops on the borders of a free, independent, and sovereign Ukraine. The citizens of Ukraine mobilized Ukraine's military expanded. And for two years of hard and intense fighting, the people of Ukraine have sacrificed their lives and their homes to beat back a larger and supposed more capable military. Despite the enormity of the challenge, Ukraine halted initial Russian advances, preventing them from taking Kyiv, and launched successful and offensive operations to retake territory in the eastern parts of their country. Ukrainian forces were able to retake more than half of the territory that Russia temporarily occupied during the early stages of the conflict. Although Russia has made some incremental gains since it has, uh, has been at a great cost of personnel and equipment, Ukraine continues retrenching their defenses to fortify their lines and maximize the effects of their ammunition and supplies. From the beginning, Ukraine has asked for the capability and training to stay in the fight. And for two years, Ukrainian forces have used this coalition's support to repel Russian attacks using innovative strategies and tactics. They have consistently imposed severe tolls on Russian forces and capabilities. Heavy costs on the battlefield, combined with our collective pressure on the Russian economy, has forced Russia to turn to the likes of Iran and North Korea to replenish its military stockpiles and enable its war against Ukraine. For two years, we have shown the outcomes we can achieve when we act together and provide support to Ukraine. Russia's plan, Russia's plan is to wait out Western will to support Ukraine. This coalition must not let that strategy work. 
Collectively, allies and partners contributed more than $88 billion in security assistance. This support doesn't just help Ukraine. It strengthens NATO. It helps to bolster the defense industrial base of the United States, Europe, and the world. It enables our own security. The collective support will ensure Ukraine is successful today and into the future. As President Biden and Secretary Austin have said, the United States will continue to stand with Ukraine. Peace and security are more than just words. It is more than just belief. Peace and security require constant work and constant action. The Def Ukraine Defense Contact Group will continue its work to achieve peace and security for Ukraine and for all. And thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you both, gentlemen. Our first question will come from Missy Ryan, Washington Post. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Austin, um, nice to see you. First for you, how great is the risk of a, of a major Russian breakthrough given the shortages that Ukraine is now facing? And does that danger continue to grow if the U.S. supplemental is delayed further? And do you think, given the stakes that you laid out in the fight in Ukraine, do you think the United States has a responsibility to dip further into its own stockpiles if the supplemental doesn't pass? And then for you, General Brown, um, the White House has said that the United States and Israel, based on a U.S. request, are now discussing alternatives to a major ground operation in Rafah. What alternative options exist for achieving Israel's security goals in southern Gaza, including destroying the remaining Hamas battalions? without further threatening aid delivery and further endangering the, the uh, civilians who are sheltering there, could, could it achieve those goals with some combination of targeted raids and precision strikes? Thanks. Well, thanks, Missy. It's great to see you as well. Uh, regarding um, a potential Russian breakthrough, uh, what we've seen on the battlefield is a series of incremental gains by, uh, by the Russians. To the point that the chairman made a couple of minutes ago, uh, these gains have come at uh, significant cost uh, in terms of personnel and equipment. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we have seen uh, some incremental gains. And as I have engaged my, uh, my counterparts and, uh, and the chief of defense uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, um, they feel confident in their ability to continue to uh, defend their sovereign territory and, uh, and hold the line. Of course, uh, they need munitions, they need, uh, they need support in order to be able to continue to do that. And, and of course, uh, that's where the supplemental comes in. And we, we certainly uh, would hope that uh, we would see the supplemental get passed uh, uh, soon. Uh, you know, I continue to see broad support in both chambers of con uh, Congress uh, for, the, for Ukraine. And so uh, I'm optimistic that we will see uh, some action uh, moving forward, but, uh, but again, uh, this, uh, this is a thing that you can't absolutely predict, and we'll continue to work closely with Congress and our international partners to ensure that uh, Ukraine receives the support it needs. The thing I would like to highlight, uh, Missy, is that the United States is not doing this alone. Um, as you witnessed today, again, some 50 countries uh, <clears throat> gathered for the 20th time uh, to, uh, to uh, address security assistance for Ukraine. And in that, in that meeting, I continued to hear uh, unity and resolve uh, and an effort to find a way to continue to provide that support. So we're seeing allies and partners step up, but the, uh, the support from the United States of America, of course, is very, very important. Uh, thanks, Missy, for the uh, question. Uh, having not seen the uh, detailed plans that uh, the Israelis uh, might have for Rafa, it, it's hard for me to, to, to lay out a, an alternative. Um, and even so, I wouldn't provide you uh, specifics in this form, naturally. Uh, but uh, one of the things, that, if, as I've engaged with my counterpartners, we've engaged with the Israelis uh, throughout, uh, even uh, shortly after 7 October. Uh, we've had experience in uh, operating in, uh, in uh, urban environments in the Middle East. Uh, we continue to talk about uh, how we, the lessons learned that we have without telling, dictating to uh, the Israelis on, on how to execute. Uh, at the same time, we, we also talk to them about the, uh, how do we protect civilians. And I can say from personal experience, having uh, led the, uh, parts of the uh, air campaign and the defeat ISIS effort, uh, our focus on how do you protect civilians and minimize any type of collateral damage is a continued conversation. And that will be an aspect of the conversation 
uh, that we will have with the, as I, we continue to have with the Israelis as they uh, uh, ponder future operations. Thank you. Our next question will go to Uta Spangenberger, ARD. Hello. Uh, a question to both gentlemen. Are there plans to transfer the Ukraine Defense Contact Group into NATO structures? It would make things maybe easier or just the other way around, more complicated? Thanks, Yuta. Uh, good to see you again. Um, the UDCG has been a very effective forum, as you know. Again, we met, this is the 20th meeting, uh, and each of these meetings are well attended, and each of these meetings, uh, again, uh, our partners and allies come and express uh, uh, sustained support for Ukraine. Now, over time, uh, Uta, we'll shift from a uh, focus on the current fight uh, solely to uh, more of a focus on building a longer-term uh, capability for Ukraine. And you're already starting to see that uh, with what we're doing with our capability coalitions. Uh, we're, we have uh, uh, countries that have volunteered to lead these coalitions that are focused on the critical uh, warfighting capabilities that Ukraine will need to be able to defend its sovereign territory and deter aggression in the future. Uh, and so we'll see that, trans that, that transition continue as we go forward. Uh, but for right now, we're focused on making sure that we can get uh, Ukraine uh, the security assistance that it needs to be successful uh, today and in the near and midterm. So. Thank you. Next question will go to Nancy Youssef, Wall Street Journal. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Austin, in December, you warned that if Israel did not protect civilians in Gaza, it risked a tactical win, but strategic defeat. Since that time, we've seen tens of thousands of civilians in Gaza killed or wounded, and now they face potential famine. Has the U.S. considered withholding offensive weapons that Israel has asked for? And if not, why do you believe that the U.S. has right to build piers and conduct airdrops, but not leverage everything it can, including conditions on weapons, to open land routes and protect civilians. General Brown, in light of Niger's announcement that it will end its military relationship with the United States, are U.S. forces leaving? If so, when and how? And how would that impact the U.S. counterterrorism operations in the region? Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, to take us back to where this started on October 7th, Hamas launched a brutal attack uh, against Israel and killed 1,200 uh, Israelis uh, and took 200 uh, Israelis hostage, hostage. And 100 of those hostages are still uh, held by Hamas. Uh, and so uh, we acknowledge from the very beginning that Israel has a fundamental right to be able to defend itself. Uh, and, uh, and so we're going to continue to support them as a as they try to do that uh, and ensure that they have what they need to defend their people. But we also recognize the importance of ensuring that people remain safe in Gaza. And, and the two things aren't mutually exclusive. You know, you can conduct operations to defend your sovereign territory you can, you can, uh, and protect your people, uh, but by the same token, uh, protect civilians in the battle space and provide humanitarian assistance to uh, uh, to those people that are in need uh, in the space as well. And we have encouraged, we continue to encourage uh, the Israeli leadership to do just that, to make sure that they're doing everything possible to uh, get uh, increasing amounts of uh, humanitarian assistance uh, into, into Gaza. And we are doing everything that we can do to, to help as well. You've seen us do airdrops, uh, and certainly if we can increase the volume of humanitarian assistance, uh, by providing uh, uh, an option, a maritime option, that, that makes a lot of sense. We, we could, you know, maybe uh, increase the amount of meals that provi are provided on a daily basis by some two million meals, which is, that's, a, that's material, that's substantial. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we will continue to do that. Israel has a right to defend itself, uh, but they also, there are, there's also a need to protect the, uh, the civilians in the battle space. And again, the two things aren't mutually exclusive. 
Nancy, thanks for the question. Uh, as you uh, saw over the course of the weekend, there uh, was uh, some announcements from the uh, from Niger about uh, our, our relationship. But even since then, there's been some mixed signals that uh, we received. And so um, um, if a decision is made to depart, uh, we, we make plans, as you might imagine, we always make plans for uh, different contingencies. And so we will continue to uh, make plans and prepare uh, if uh, whether we stay or, or, or depart. Uh, what I would tell you just on the impact of counterterrorism, uh, you know, since the events in July, uh, that has impacted uh, our ability to support uh, our counterterrorism. Uh, and as we uh, look to the future, we will continue to look at the uh, other uh, nations within the West Africa, as well as uh, some of the allies and partners are actually are working counterterrorism. And uh, matter of fact, I had a chance to sit down with a couple of the uh, chiefs of defense that are also working counterterrorism uh, in uh, uh, West Africa as well to talk more holistically about uh, our approach as we uh, we all work together uh, as we do, just like we're here working on uh, Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Our final question will go to IEC Tabi Al Jazeera. Thank you, sir. Um, I just follow my question of my colleagues about Gaza. Over the past 24 hours, the uh, Israeli army has carried out a series of fire strikes in the city of Rafah, uh, leaving dozens dead and injured. As you know, Rafah hosts uh, one million and a half civilians. And we know that Mr. President Biden um, um, urged the uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu not to launch an attack on Rafah. But the attack is going on. My question to you, sir, what your position now in this military Israeli operation on the ground right now? Thank you, sir. Well, thank you for the question. And, you know, we've been clear about the need to prioritize the protection of civilians uh, and that a military operation should not uh, proceed without a clear an implementable plan uh, to evacuate those civilians out of the battle space and also care for them once you once you evacuate them. Now we've communicated this uh, a number of times from the president's level on down, and certainly you know I've uh, communicated with my uh, my counterpart a number of times. So um, that that should be a key part of uh, any military any plan any any type of operational planning. Uh, to, to account for and protect those civilians that are in the battle space. Uh, and again, uh, we've yet to see uh, such a plan, but uh, we'll have an opportunity to engage uh, uh, the leadership here uh, on that soon. So. Secretary Austin, General Brown, thank you both very much, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our press briefing. Thank you very much for joining us today.